Am I on? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, now that I'm here and I'm actually on the speaker, um, I'd like to open with a story. Uh, I was thinking about how to introduce this, and the story uh, occurred to me was perfect. So I went to California in early, uh, in late January, and when I boarded the plane, uh, the Donald had just issued the Muslim ban. Uh, I was flying for 11 hours, and when I landed in San Francisco and we walked towards the immigration building, the protests were full on. So we heard them chant outside, and after 11 hours of flight, European time, 2 o'clock in the morning, we faced a huge queue. Because, of course, the custom officers, they were overwhelmed and understaffed, and most of them were outside uh, because of the protests. And we had a queue of three hours in front of us. So while we're standing there with families, small children, a couple of techies, uh, I was assessing the situation. And I got this impression there is a huge queue and nobody's really paying attention. And there is a single barrier which I could easily slip underneath. It was a simple uh, thing to pass the U.S. immigration. It would be so easy. I felt I was passing out a bit, and self-doubts came up, and in the end, I decided I wouldn't do that. It would probably not be such a smart idea, but I felt like I could really exploit this. In the end, I made it to the front of the queue. I was questioned. All my backpack was undone. They had a lot of interesting questions. Finally, they sent me on into the United States, and when I thought I had passed the border, I came into a huge empty hall. And people were only trickling in, of course, because the long queue. So there was empty and a single person at the very end. And all the person did was checking a handwritten mark on my immigration form. So obviously, I was facing multiple layers of security. And the first layer was highly sophisticated, a trained custom officer who was interrogating me. And the second layer was extremely stupid and simple. And it would have easily defeated me immediately. I was, would have been able to pass the first one, but passing that second very stupid layer of defense would have been, for me, impossible without the knowledge to put this mark on the forum. So what brings us this? What I want to propose to you and what I'm going to talk about is that we need multiple layers of security. What we need is additional layers of security which are a good return investment, so simple to set up, easy to operate, adding an additional benefit, additional security for your system, your service, or your organization. And as it happens, the OWASP mod security core rule set is uh, such a system. Uh, I like to, to liken it to, uh, to seat belts. We all use seat belts when we drive cars. Uh, we all know a seat belt is no silver bullet. Uh, not all car accidents will be harmless because of a seat belt, but we know for relatively little hassle, we add a lot of safety. That's why we put it on. It's a natural added safety layer uh, when driving a car, together with a front airbag and a, a very well-built modern car. And all together, they form a safety package. So it's additional 80%, uh, uh, multiple 80% solutions stacked on each other, which together bring us good security. What is the program today? Uh, I somehow ended up in the CISO track. Um, that was not where I was expecting mod security. So I introduced one or two slides uh, to introduce the basic concept on this. I hope to take the whole room with me there. Then I had planned to do an installation demo on uh, my notebook not on this notebook, unfortunately. So we have to skip the, skip the installation demo that happens. Uh, and then I'm going to present a few uh, research results. I'm going to walk you through key concept of the core rule set and how you can use them. And then near the end, I'm going to present you with uh, additional documentation that should take you from here to higher level of security. What you can do when you return to your organization next week to try things out where you find additional tutorials, information, documentation. So let's dive in. Web application firewalls. Uh, 
Web application firewalls are basically uh, sitting on a server inspecting incoming and outgoing HTTP traffic. They try to catch malign requests and their suspicious responses. Of course, you can argue that putting a smart device in front of the code is a very stupid idea. Wouldn't it be better to fix the code in the application? Uh, but I think if 20 years of web security have taught us one thing is that fixing the code completely is extremely hard. <laughs> and it seems that recipe doesn't really work in the real world. So an additional layer of security can be or should be added in form of a WAF, which is one such layer. Uh, the PCI DSS uh, standard recommends WAFs. It is a highly contested uh, area. Uh, there is a hard commercial competition, lots of hype, lots of marketing, and lots of fad. In the end, I think WAF installations boil down to three types. There are naive, overwhelmed, and functional WAF installations. Naive uh, uh, WAF installations, and I'm talking to the CISOs in the room. A naive WAF uh, installation is a, gui a green check mark on a report. We have a WAF, we are secure now. That is naive. It's very likely it's not even in line, it's not switched on, it's in monitoring mode, nobody's paying any attention. That is a naive uh, setup. An overwhelmed setup is one which is actually switched on and it has a ton of interesting knobs and levers to put, a lot of uh, ticks to click, and a lot of documentation, which is very hard to understand unless you're an expert. And when you really switch it on, you're overwhelmed by log files and reports and likely false positives. And very often people put it in, in the corner or they wait for the boss to call and tell them, switch this shit off. It blocks our customers. Uh, then there are the functional uh, WAF setups, which are, it's actually, it's a rare species. <laughs> My job is uh, uh, taking people from naive or overwhelmed over to functional, and uh, it's kind of hard, or it takes specific knowledge, or it takes the right tool set, or the right documentation. It's not, it's not uh, standard business to achieve this. Uh, and what I'm going to, to show you now is that with the mod security core rule set, in the modern version, you have a very basic setup which gives you 80% of the security by default. And once you're comfortable with that, you can raise to even higher levels. So for a very little resources, you get a fairly good security level without all the hassle and be functional, functional from the start. So, Mod security. Uh, open source people kind of hate WAFs somehow. And that's why almost all the WAFs are commercial. There are dozens of them. Uh, in Switzerland alone, there are three uh, commercial uh, providers of WAFs. So what you end up, because all the open source people hate WAFs so much, you end up with a single free all-purpose WAF offering, which is mod security. There are a few specialized ones as well, but mod security is doing the whole web. Um, mod security is actually an Nginx or Apache or IIS module. M most people use it in Nginx or Apache. It's a server module which provides you with an engine. So it's the basic engine on top of with the help of that engine, you're then building your web functionality. So you need rules on top. Um, in fact, there are quite a few of the commercial WAFs who have a mod security underneath. So the three Swiss WAF offerings, one of them has mod security inside. And a, a, quite a few of the other commercial ones they have mod security and likely Apache under the hood. They're just not advertising that fact. Um, so what is mod security? It, it is not a modern, sophisticated, artificial intelligence, super smart, cloud-enabled uh, mastermind, not at all. Mod security is much more resembling a mechanical Swiss watch. It is, it is a mechanical device based on rules which gives you granular control over requests and responses 
down to the byte level. And to make use of this functionality, you need rules, and you either hate yourself and you write them yourself, which is really hard, or you take a good predefined rule set. And the OWASP Smart Security core rule set is the standard rule set most people use with mod security. But it's not the only one. And it's two different projects. So you have the engine and the rule set. You need to keep them a part of it uh, in the mind. So uh, once you have the engine, this is where the core rule set comes in. Here we are. So the OWASP uh, core rule set is a vendor of OWASP flagship project of over 10 years. So it's been around for quite a long time. It has died down a bit during the years, uh, but there is new management now. So Kame Sanders uh, took over uh, the lead of the CRS uh, project in 2015 from Ryan Burnett, who quit the mod security community. And Kame recruited Walter Hopp from a Dutch uh, hosting provider and me to form the core team of this project. We're now growing the project again, building the community. And last winter, we released CRS3, so core rule set 3.0, uh, which is the first mass, uh, major release in years. And the focus of that release is working on false positive. I'll come back to that in a second. So the, the project is, has been revived. We're alive and kicking, and we're open to more people join us to share the workload. And we have lots of very good ideas, <laughs> apparently, as every cool project. <laughs> we just don't have enough hands to type all the cool rules. <laughs> uh, we also did a, a very cool release poster, I think, uh, with the help of OWASP, who paid for this. And if you like the poster, I have a few of them with me. Come and see me uh, after the talk. There must be like 10 or 15 of them left. I handed a few out already. Um, OK. Now uh, we would do the installation demo. Uh, what would be the installation demo? Uh, it would be this, uh, basically. Uh, as you've seen, my notebook doesn't like the Beamer or the other way around, so I'll walk you through it orally. Uh, the core rule set is hosted on, on GitHub, apparently. You clone it, and then you get all the rules. The rules is a set of about two dozen of files, which uh, part of this distribution. There is a setup file which you copy. So there is an example and you copy it over and then you can leave it as is. The defaults are very sane and defaults are fairly secure. The default installation is the basic security package you want to have on any web server. And, and then you go to the server configuration uh, Depends a bit which one you use. This one is attack at Apache syntax. You include the CRS setup conf, so this configuration file, which is created, you include this, and then you include asterisk conf, you include the rule files. That, that's it. That's the whole installation. In my demo, this took me two minutes. <laughs> and what do you get with this? You get a set of rules, like 150 rules, which were executed sequentially when a request comes in. And these are mostly regular expressions looking for specific patterns. Now, you could do, uh, there is SNORT and IDS, which has very clear exploit-oriented patterns. Uh, the core rule set is much more generic. It doesn't look at an attack, uh, an individual uh, exploit, it looks at a basic pattern. For example, we're using uh, the libinjection library, which is very strong at detecting SQL injections via tokenization. So uh, it tries to take a parameter, includes it in standard SQL queries, and try to make sense of it. Will this result in a parsable SQL query? If that is true, then it's probably an SQL injection attack. This is a very successful, fairly new approach, uh, which we make use of in the core rule set. And then lots of additional stuff. Uh, once uh, the demo included a request to a, a very stupid, uh, stupid little application or script, which would display local files. 
And of course, you can also use it to display the standard uh, system files on a system. And uh, that works and is highly vulnerable. You should fix the code. If you, don't, if you don't fix the code, then put at least the core rule set in front. And it would identify the parameters because it knows people usually tend to display the password file on a, on a, on a Linux system. So it knows several hundreds of standard files which it will no longer allow as a parameter in a request that gives you a good basic security. So the core rule set are generic rules which don't block everything, but most of the stuff. Uh, does this really work in practice? Yeah, it does. Uh, this is a graph from a uh, research I'm performing with Damiano Esposito from the Zurich University of Applied Science. So I'm the defender, and he's the attacker. He's the expert on a application vulnerability scanners, especially uh, is very strong on burp. So he created or let burp execute four and a half million requests against a vulnerable application. It was an uh, application, uh, don't tweet just yet. The, the slide will be even better in a few seconds. <laughs> uh, so the, the vulnerable application we had was WAFSEP. WAFSEP is a web application firewall evaluation project. So it's broken to see will the WAF uh, protect everything or the security scanner, will he detect all the weaknesses? That's the plan. And when Burp attacked the WAFSEP, it had out of the four and a half million, it would uh, tell us that almost 1,100 of his requests hit a weakness immediately. Uh, so that's the basic no protection setup. And then with this simple configuration, so we put this in, and then we removed the burp identification because it would be very easy to identify burp on the user agent. So we had burp hide the user agent uh, to be not immediately identified as burp. And with this basic installation, we came down to 170 vulnerabilities in the default install. Uh, on the right is a short interpretation. Uh, in the default install, we're not doing very good on redirects and remote file inclusions, but the local file inclusions, they're essentially gone. That would be the moment to tweet. <laughs> in fact, I would welcome that. It's a very cool slide. Cross-site scripting is mostly uh, gone, and your SQL injections uh, for burp have disappeared. So burp is no longer able to push an SQL injection on a vulnerable application. I'm not stating that it is impossible to do an SQL injection with call rules set in place. That is not the case. With the help of a very stupid application, you might still be able to, put, to push an SQL injection through, but it's getting a lot harder. And the average security scanner uh, will no longer be able to do this and even burp. I mean, Damiano uh, tweaked burp extremely well to take the maximum out of it. So this is no standard burp setup anymore. That's a very strong burp setup in here. And the research is not finished yet. We're continuing with SAP, Arachne, Wapiti, and the additional security scanners. And we hope to finish this work during the summer. Uh, we're not looking at the additional bars. Uh, now, just the first two ones. I'll return to the slide later on. This is the, the rule files, which we included a couple of minutes ago. Uh, these are the rules targeting the request. Uh, they're, they're part of these files. Uh, depending on the file, there are more or less of them. All combined on the request side, they're like 150 rules. So uh, we do scanner detection. Obviously, that's where we usually detect uh, crawlers, scanners, bots. Uh, we do protocol enforcement. There are quite a lot of rules in this. And this counters the, the hippie attitude, or let's say liberal attitude, of web servers when it comes to protocols. They tend to swallow, swallow everything. And uh, Coral said is much stricter. If you're not issuing a user agent, then you're probably not a browser. 
If you have a numerical IP host header, then you're unlikely to be a browser, and so on. So the protocol is quite strict how an HTTP request should look like. The server is very nice with you, but CRS is not. Either you comply or you hit the limit. Then an additional uh, group of files is targeting individual attacks. So we're very strong on remote command execution, especially in CRS3, very strong on PHP injection, good on cross-site scripting, and I think very strong on SQL injection. Traditionally, SQL injection has been the strongest area of core rule set, and this has improved even more with the CRS3. The request is running through all these rules, throughout these files, and then at the bottom line, the 949 is the blocking evaluation. So it is only then that the core rule set will decide, will I let this request in or not? It is not blocking immediately by default. You can change the behavior, but the standard behavior now is to look at all the rules and then draw the total in the end. Outgoing, the response rules, they're a bit fewer in numbers, and as we came to see uh, in the research we did, we're a bit weaker here. So these patterns are a bit outdated, so it seems a modern Tomcat is issuing different uh, error messages, and CRS was no longer able to identify all of them. So we let error messages, Java stack traces out to the client, which is, of course, uh, pretty bad. So after the research, uh, the first uh, step of the research, we created 13 issues on weaknesses which we identified in the rule set. Mind you, one of them was really annoying. We had uh, a cross-site scripting passing the rule set in a fairly high security setting. So I think that was the biggest issue with this research that we showed up. Most that passed through were redirects or out-of-band communication, which is really hard to detect when... The client uh, submits uh, a host name as a parameter, and the stupid application does a DNS lookup on that. So that is out-of-band communication, and that's really hard to, to catch for us. Uh, we'll see if we can do anything about it. So we run through all the rules, and uh, we do kind of a scoring. Uh, how does that work? Uh, I, I need a bit of support here with this. Uh, I need a, fo a few volunteers to demonstrate this, how this works. Uh, could I have uh, like five or six guys come up on the stage, please? Ideally, the first ranks. <laughs> come, guys. <laughs> okay, that's five. That's already very good. We have somebody with a hoodie. Thank you. Uh, I forgot a piece. Okay, so, uh, very good. You stand here at the very end. You guys here, you're going to be our evaluation at the end. This is the limit. <laughs> Could you two guys take this? And we do, we, st we need an additional volunteer. Could you, come on. <laughs> we do one of you. So at least three rules, that's very good. Stand here, please. So uh, these three uh, nice gentlemen are our rules. And they have uh, score tags. That's a plus five. You're a plus five rule. You're another plus five rule. And he is only three points. <laughs> and uh, here on the left, we have our attacker. Could you put up your hoodie? Because attackers always wear hoodies. Are yeah. behind me or anything? Yeah, or? yeah. That, that, that. <laughs> And look very dangerous, please. <laughs> and uh, we're easing into an installation. So the limits we are setting is really relaxed. Put this bar very, very high. And, and now our attacking request approaches the web server. And, and, and here is the SSL, the TLS layer. And here starts HTTP <laughs> with the core rule set. Please approach the rule set and now all the rules will examine him. And you can decide, do you identify him as an attacker? If you do, then you put your five points on his back. He's wearing a hoodie. 
He's wearing a hoodie. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> then you approach the next rules, and basically we have like 150 of those stacked behind each other. But we're not enough people in the room, and we don't have enough time. So you identify him as well. Yep. Yeah. But no, no longer on the hoodie. You, you examine something else. So there are different characteristics of a re request covered by different rules. You see anything or you let him pass? He's fine. He's fine. And in our setup, because the limit is very relaxed, he will easily pass. So despite triggering two rules, he's passing. That is a test procedure or a test setup where we don't want to annoy the standard users. To the application should continue, and we want to examine the behavior. So pass underneath. Attacker passed, exploited. Uh, we're probably already doomed. <laughs> okay, I'm handing you back again. And then we examine the logs, and we might have to treat false positives. And then when we, try, when we start to trust the system a bit, we lower the limits in multiple iterations. I usually tell people to take like five iterations to get into a hard blocking production mode. So the default installation, which I showed you, is already blocking. But on a production real uh, commercial system, I would raise uh, these limits to start with a bit. To get, just for a practical setup. And then you can go as low as you wish. I would say knees level is a, that is five. Are you good, uh, in dancing the whole, yeah, yeah, yeah? <laughs> can, can, will you manage? I could. Uh, are you could? Okay, well, let's give it a shot. <laughs> uh, he, he needs points, he needs points. <laughs> okay, now you need to go to shoe level now. <laughs> But then you would give up, wouldn't you? <laughs> okay, so did you get the idea? This is how this scoring works. We have multiple rules working together, scoring an individual request. We're always looking at the request. We're not session oriented. We're looking at an individual request with the current rule set. And the lower you go with the limit, the harder you are. So that is a basic concept. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so, uh, anomaly scoring is a basic concept of the call rule set. Uh, other basic concepts is below here. So, on the left, you had the no protection. Then came the default install. The default install and then came a paranoia level two, three, and four. And the higher the paranoia level, the less attack requests would be able to pass the rule set. So the higher the paranoia level, the harder for the attacker. How does this work? Uh, we have four paranoia levels. The default is paranoia level one. This is what we call the basic security level with a minimal set of false positives. So we have organized the rules on the likeliness of false positives. In the default install, you hardly get any false positives at all. If you get false positives in the default install, please open an issue on GitHub. We want to know, we want to improve this, we want to tune it. You should not face any false positive in a default installation. Traditionally, Coral set had a ton of false positive. That was made it very hard. But this is no longer the case. The CRS3 really aimed for false positives. In the default installation, they're gone. They're hidden now in higher paranoia levels. If you raise the paranoia setting to two in the, in the setup, uh, in the config file which we created at the beginning, you're now a security aware application. You say, we have real assets which we want to protect and we are accepting false positives from time to time which we have to handle, which we have to prepare for. I'm returning on the topic afterwards. Uh, and then at paranoia level three, you get more rules, more specialized rules and also more false positives. If you look back here, you will see 
that a paranoia level two and three are almost the same. Uh, so this is, this is fairly new, and we're adding more rules in here. So right now, uh, PL3 does not give you much benefit, but this is where the development happens now. And this I would call online banking level security. Paranoia level four, which is really insane, uh, is then the top level of security. I call it the nuclear power plant level security. Or I'm working on an e-voting system in Switzerland, so online voting, where we want the highest security possible. And one of the many, many security layers is a paranoia level four mod security coral set set up, which makes it quite tricky for an attacker to pass this. So these paranoia levels, how do they, how do they work in practice? Basically, if we look at an example, the protocol enforcement, at the paranoia level one, we have 31 rules. And then at level two, there is an additional seven rules, which are a bit harder, a bit more aggressive, a bit more paranoid. And as you know, with paranoia comes either aggressiveness and fast judgments, misjudgments, craziness, and false positives. A false positive is a dog biting the mailman. It's a guarding dog who attacks a good person. That is a false positive. And you don't want false positives. They start to pop up at level two. At paranoia level three, we only have one additional rules uh, in the protocol enforcement. And at paranoia level four, we have four additional very tough rules. Let's take an example. Uh, let's take something which we call stricter siblings. Stricter siblings is like a family of rules. Uh, there is a rule or a group of rules which targets byte enforcement, byte range enforcement. So we're targeting the ASCII range, and by default in paranoia level one, we say we're accepting the full ASCII range minus the null byte. There is no reason ever to submit a null byte to a web server. So this is illegal, but we're, we're okay with all the rest. This is basic security. In paranoia level two, there is a new stricter sibling which says, we only want the full visible range now. The, all the crazy steering codes, they're no longer acceptable, but we also take in tabs into new line in. That, that's okay, that happens in text areas and stuff like that. In PL3, we concentrate now on the lower SQ range, which is visible, and no longer the percent sign. Because the percent sign, you can encode a lot of crazy stuff in that. We no longer want to see that. And then the paranoia level four, we're super strict with enforcing the byte range. There is only a couple of, of characters which are allowed now. And it will be very hard for an attacker to create an attack using only these requests or ASCII characters in a request. I think you get the idea, don't you? That is fairly straightforward. So these are stricter siblings. What else? Uh, the sampling mode. Uh, sampling mode is a basic uh, concept. Uh, when you start a new service and you start remote security from the beginning, initial testing, that, that's great. But often people, they already have a production service. They have a lot of traffic. And mod security adds a load, it adds latency, we cannot deny this. And we wanted to give people uh, the means to ease into an installation. That is the sampling mode. So you define, in the config file again, you define a percentage of requests which should be funneled into the core rule set. So if you set this to like uh, 10, then 90% of the requests will, uh, will pass uh, through the, uh, the core rule set or around the core rule set, and only 10% will be funneled into the rules. Uh, and this allows you to, to gauge uh, the viability of this core rule set on your existing server without affecting all your customers immediately. And this is very good for per to trying out the performance. Is the web server able to swallow this? That's really helpful. Uh, sampling mode. So let's come back to these false positives. I wouldn't say it's a basic concept, but it's, it's, it's a basic occurrence when running above. 
Uh, the commercial vendors will tell you they don't have false positives, and I think most of them are lying. Because you cannot tell good from bad without having a false positive occasionally. Uh, Coral set has false positives. Very few ones in default installation, but as you raise the paranoia level, you go to higher levels of security, they'll pop up. What you do with them? What you need to do is you need to write rule exclusions. And a rule exclusion is basically a mod security rule again. It is a rule which disables a different rule. There are basically four, uh, four rule exclusion types or basic patterns. And I'm explaining this in, uh, in a series of tutorials which I've written. You can download them at netnea.com, which is my uh, small Swiss company. And there is also a cheat sheet to download from there. So these are the four patterns. How you can do that? You can disable a rule completely. That's fairly obvious. It's probably not the smartest way to deal with a, a false positive, but it's very straightforward. What you can do is disable a rule for a given path and say, look, this is the API. We're only uh, client certificate authenticated requests on this path. I can disable this rule for this path. Fair enough. You can disable a rule for a given parameter. And you say, look, we're in a high paranoia setting. We're not accepting the full ASCII byte range. But on this particular parameters, we need to have special characters. So that is a standard way of handling a false positive. And you can handle them with a combination of the two. So disable a rule on a given path for an individual parameter. So these are the four basic forms of working with uh, rule exclusions. And uh, what we do, in fact, is we have set up this wall of core rule set. At the highest paranoia level, the wall is very high. And when we face false positives, we have to pierce hole into the wall. And each of these holes is a little weakness. I mean, let's be honest, it's a little weakness. But the biggest weakness is the boss calling switch the shit off. It's blocking our service. So I'm, when I'm, I'm teaching uh, courses, I tell people, you, you better are fairly liberal with piercing a few holes. There are 180 rules all combined and a lot of parameters, a lot of path. Disable individual rules to make sure the customer, the business is not affected. Because once you affect the business, the whole WAF is disabled extremely quick and you will not dare to switch it on ever again. So that's why we have the cheat sheet that really helps with handling false positives. And uh, then we also have predefined rule sets or predefined rule exclusions. Uh, with the current uh, release, we have packages of rules exclusions for uh, standard Drupal and WordPress installations. Obvious WordPress is the biggest uh, application on the internet uh, right now, very widespread and running on PHP and notoriously insecure. And, and you, if you raise the paranoia level to two, you get quite a few false positives on WordPress. And we don't want all the users to handle the same false positives. So we, we released the Coral set together with a pack of rule exclusions. And if you run WordPress, you enable the WordPress rule exclusion in the config file again, uncomment a single uh, directive, and then you have you covered for the basic WordPress installation. This does not mean it covers the, the plugins so far. Not for WordPress, not for Drupal. And this is also something we're, we're hoping for the community, or we're building on a community to support us and submit the, fall, the handling of their false positives. And we're very open to guide you through uh, writing false positive rule exclusions or helping you interpret the log files to come up with good rule exclusions. And we want to include them in further future releases. In the queue, we have Typo3 and PVIC uh, default rule exclusion packs. And we're really open for contributions. That would be awesome to receive more of those. So let me round up before I come to the end and the questions. 
ask a question and answer session. Uh, so the core rule set is a first line or a possible first line of defense against web attacks. In the default setup, you cover like 80% of the web attacks and the standard security scanner stuff. It is a generic set of blacklisting rules, 150, 180, depending on the setting, uh, for the mod security buff. And it gives you granular control on individual requests, individual parameters, to allow them in even on high paranoia settings. Uh, so that's the final slide. I'm Christian Follini. You reach me via email or via Twitter. I'm welcoming new followers. Uh, as it happens, I'm also the author of the second edition of the Mod Security Handbook. I took this over from Ivan Ristich when he left the community. Uh, I have a series of Mod Security uh, CRS tutorials at netnea.com. Uh, I'm also running courses on Mod Security, either in-house or public courses. And uh, the book is about to appear in print. It has been on sale for a couple of months now as PDF. And there is a voucher code uh, during the conference. If you want to download the book immediately, the, there is a 40% uh, voucher credit with the code AppSecU. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for uh, having me. <laughs> Yes, thanks very much, Christian there. Fantastic. Um, any questions, please? Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, my question is, uh, you said that you have this bunch of rules and this score system. That, yes. Uh, yeah. And the question is, if why we not uh, like block, block the... Uh, actual request if we reach the threshold. So why we need to go through all those like rule set? Okay, uh, what you can do is block the request once it hits the first rule. You can do this. Uh, and having it block once it hits the threshold it has to do with the rule language. You cannot easily do this with the rule language. Because in a given rule you can only examine a single characteristic. So what we would have to do is, after each rule, look at the score again. And that's not practical and not very performing. So either you block immediately or you block after a re given request phase. Uh, Mod security uh, knows five request phases. So request header, request body, response header, response body, and logging. What we are doing now is we're blocking after the request body. But we have a feature request, uh, which we wrote ourselves, to, uh, to evaluate the score the first time after the request headers, because that would be a good moment to do it. Uh, this is coming closer to, to your idea, but to really do this, uh, Mod Security is not allowing this, unfortunately. Cool, lots of questions, I like that. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned that uh, mod security is basically based on rec access plus this additional library. And maybe you can go, go a little bit more into detail. Um, basically, rec access are not capable of basically catching the full uh, extent of uh, context-free languages, what we are dealing with here. And uh, so there are basically false positive and false negatives already in, which is basically the result from basic computer science. Yeah. Maybe you can comment on that a little okay, bit. Okay, I can comment on that. So uh, Mod Security is offering you like uh, 30 or 40 operators. And the regular expression operator is one of those. It's the standard operator. Most uh, rules are based on that operator, but not all of them. And what, uh, what our rules are doing is they look at very small pieces of the request, each of the rules. And then they are overlapping a lot. Stricter siblings are doing the same, but stricter. So, and all combined, we think we kind of catch them. But it's definitely not a whole concept or a holistic view of understanding an HTTP request. It's looking at individual characteristics in the request. And this takes you only so and so far. Absolutely. And you can prove that you can work around every web application firewall given enough time. 
That's why I'm not saying this is your silver bullet. It's not. It is something which gives you a good level of security for not too much investment in resources. And you have to see the limits of this approach, absolutely. Um, have you any comparative figures between the speed overhead? So the, um, you mentioned that these rules are being yeah. performed sequentially. Yeah. Um, have you any comparative figures for maybe, for example, paranoia level one versus two? How Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a chapter in the book where, uh, where we look at performance of mod security. Mod security is extremely helpful when it comes to performance. Uh, helpful in the sense it eats performance, but it also is very transparent where it eats performance. So you can very easily gauge the performance of individual rules, of individual requests, and I did this uh, for mod security and the core rule set at all the paranoia levels for the book. So I would say basically mod security will add, it will you will lose one or two percent performance just for the fact of having mod security there. And then uh, an individual uh, rule by the, its mere existence on a mid-sized uh, Amazon server took me one nanosecond or half to one nanosecond. So all the rules combined were in, this, in a few hundred nanoseconds range. For a standard service, my experience is you lose like 5% of performance. You add 5% latency on top. Uh, I think this is defendable. You can, you can do that, but it's, it's there. And if, you, if you're in a bad situation, it can be substantially more. And then uh, there are ways to deal with that. Uh, what you typically have uh, a performance hog is res uh, uh, rules working on with regular expressions on the response body. And then you have static files, megabyte big, and the regular expression takes two seconds. <laughs> so that's crazy. Uh, and what, of course, what you do is you disable that because uh, if, the, if it's a, a, cross, a, a CSS file, which is static, we're no longer inspecting it for, uh, for SQL leakages. So, yeah, you can handle that. So, can you give us some more color on the percentage of improvement comparing to 226 or 228? Uh, yes. Uh, let me go back to the rules. Uh, what the biggest improvement is the false positives and the introduction of the paranoia levels. So you control the amount of false positives now, which, uh, which is a big step ahead, really. And then the SQL injection is now based on the lib injection library, which was introduced with Mod Security 2.8. That was four years ago, and we thought it's about time to use this in the core rule set. We can assume people should have upgraded by now. Uh, and the lib injection, it is great. So we kicked like 20 SQL injection rules and replaced it with this simple rule. We still have additional SQL injection rules, but that's a big improvement. Then uh, Walter Hopp, uh, the, the Dutch guy, he wrote a new set of remote command execution rules, which take a uh, couple of hundred of standard Unix and Windows common line tools into consideration. It identifies them in all set of contexts. That's extremely strong. And he did the same with PHP, uh, PHP uh, code injection. So what, what he did is he made a matrix of their uh, shell commands, which are very innocent, and they resemble English language. That's no problem. But then, of course, there are shell commands which resemble the English language, and they're extremely dangerous. So exec, evil, st system, stuff like that. And these are different groups, and we uh, use different rules for them now and try to cover, to cover them all. And so that's, uh, I would say, remote command execution, PHP code injection, SQL injection, that's the biggest improvement, together with the introduction of the sampling mode and the paranoia levels, which gives you much better leverage, uh, everything. Uh, the tutorials are there now. The documentation has been much improved. 
it's, I would say it's much easier to run it. It's much easier for newbies. It's no longer expert stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that's it. Sorry, no more questions.